Hello and welcome to the print. I am Snehesh Alex Philip. Well, a lot is happening in Canada right now. The latest news that has come out from Canada is that a temple in Brampton has been forced to cancel a live certificate even being done by the Indian High Commission there after the peel pullers came out with a statement or advised them saying that there is extremely high an imminent threat level of violence, protest, right? And now this temple has cancelled this particular event. This was supposed to happen on the 17th of this month. To understand what is really happening with the Canadian police, the, the, the radicalization that has happened, the, the possible uh, induction of the Khalistani elements into the rank and file of the Canadian police, I have with me Donald Best, an anti-corruption advocate, a former Toronto policeman. Uh, he was actually a surgeon detective who served in the Toronto police for 15 years, but he has nearly about 45 years of experience in law enforcement in both private and the government sector. Welcome to the print, Donald. Great to be here. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, so my first question to you, what is happening uh, in Canada? Why has the Canadian police not been able to ensure that a place of worship, that is a temple, is able to function smoothly? I think there's no simple answer. I think it's a, a complex question that goes back many decades, but it all comes down to this. In Canada, we have a Khalistani separatist movement that has enclaved, it has grown, they have political power, and all out of proportion to their small numbers in, in Canadian, uh, you know, in the Canadian uh, milieu. So they have achieved somehow positions of power and authority, both in the three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, and they've also achieved levels of influence especially, I think, in the civil service and in law enforcement. Now, we have a law in Canada, and it's very simple, the criminal code. It protects places of worship, Christian, Buddhist, Sikh, Hindu. They're all protected under the criminal code, and no one is allowed to interfere with worship or meetings and, and it's very clear, not just worship, but meetings in holy places. But the police, and lately Peel Regional Police, have refused to enforce that law. I've been very critical about them. We had an incident here just a little while ago where uh, at a Hindu temple in Brampton, a number of Khalistani protesters, separatists, came to the temple and disturbed that temple. Now, that was a violation of the criminal code. We also had a Peel Regional Police Officer, on, uh, off, off duty, yes, a sergeant, no less, protesting when it turned violent. The protest did. They came into the temple, and they were hitting people with sticks. I, I'm not saying the sergeant did. I haven't seen a video, whether he did or not, but he was there. And this just undermines the rule of law in Canada when the Peel police will not and did not take steps, effective steps, to protect this place of worship. Well, the next day, we had a Hindu mob in retaliation march against a Sikh place of worship. And there was violence. And... You know, so we had uh, also p some people, and some were charged by the police for inciting the mob uh, to do acts of violence. And some people in the mob were yelling, kill them, kill them. There's video of this. My position, and I, I made this quite clear, uh, is that had the Peel police upheld the rule of law, this criminal code, section 176, had they originally done that, when that Khalistani mob showed up at the Hindu temple and interrupted things. I believe that, well, people may not have done a retaliatory march. 
So absolutely, we, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Well, we like the, we like the rule of law. When people, when Canadians, when people cannot depend upon the government and law enforcement to fairly and justly protect them, then, well, here we go. Um, and this is just not, this type of sectarian violence has just not been seen in Canada in a long time and very rarely. It's so rare. And it's it, the, the Canadians are just aghast. They're horrified. And Canadians of all backgrounds. And you must remember, uh, Canadians have been taking immigrants for 100 years and more. We really have. And especially since the 60s. And, and we've taken millions and millions of people. But, you know, the, the rule here is, and the feeling here is, you leave all the troubles of the old country behind. We have, we have had uh, Germans uh, here. We've, we've had uh, Serbs and Croatians and Czechs. And, and, and horrible things have happened between all these communities, Russians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. All of these communities have experienced violence when they were back in Europe and back in their home. But here in Canada, well, we, have, we, we just try and get along. Somehow that's been violated. And of course, when I say that the Khalistanis have influence all out of proportion to their numbers, look, even the, the uh, NDP, the New Democratic Party leader, yeah. Jagmeet Singh, yeah. he is propping up the government, the liberal government. And uh, he's very much like a coalition government. The man's very powerful, holding up the government. And yet, as I understand it, he's not allowed to go to India because of his connections with uh, the separatist movement and even terrorists in it. Absolutely. And that is, that is what is surprising. You know, you talk about the influence that the Khalistanis have made into the civil service there, right? Uh, you had, of course, the surgeon that you mentioned from the PRP who was suspended. Had it been in any, any other country, would have, or in India for that matter, he would have been dismissed from service, not just suspended. But you also had this case where this, the Peel Regional Police arrested, you know, Inderjit Gosal, who, who is the uh, prime mover behind the uh, Khalistan protest that took place. But he was let off out on bail within minutes from there. So a lot of questions do arise. Tell me one thing, how is that... Uh, the Canadians or the Canadian uh, public, or is it just the politicians who've forgotten the fact that the Khalistanis were behind the biggest terror attack that Canada had seen? I'm talking about Air India Flight 182, which was bombed on 23rd June 1985, in which 329 people were killed, and majority of them were Canadians. Well, not may not be whites, but they were Canadians. Well, doesn't matter what color they were, and frankly, it doesn't matter to me whether they were Canadians or not. But it happened in Canada. The bombs were planted in Canada. Yeah. And, and people forget that a second airplane was also bombed, and it was on the ground in Japan. Two, yeah. two uh, baggage handlers were, were killed by that bomb. It could have been an even worse disaster. There could have been hundreds more killed. Yeah. This was just a, it's the, ma the most terrible act of terrorism that has ever occurred in Canada. And Canadians have not forgotten, but I truly wonder why we've allowed so many Khalistani terrorists and criminals who have obviously been known in India, and they've come over here, and they have basically... Uh, a, a root here. They have uh, a section in society here where they are very powerful and still, uh, you know, here they are coming to a Hindu place of worship and disturbing it, breaking the law and nothing was done. Absolutely. It's quite surprising because uh, these very same people are the ones who are now uh, running arms business, illegal arms business, uh, narcotics trade in Canada. My question to you, since you are a policeman, you know how how were the Khalistanis, as you say, were able to make inroads into uh, the police system in Canada? 
Uh, and what do you think should be done now? Well, you know, it's once again, there's no simple solutions. And I didn't realize until I started uh, talking about and covering this story. And I've had hundreds of people in the last few weeks reach out to me from India. And I, I'm very surprised. And I've been on many, many shows, as you know. And uh, I, I'm very surprised. But the level of interest in Canada is now peaking because we've never seen this kind of sectarian violence in Canada. But the other thing that's happening too is in Canada, we don't have a free media. The legacy media is supported by the federal government, yeah. billions of dollars every year. And this really does uh, impact the coverage, what they will cover, what they won't, and how they cover it. Now, on October 28th, just a few weeks ago, there was a shootout in Canada, in Ontario, the province where I live, with a Khalistani terrorist involved. And uh, his name was Arsh Dalla, A-R-S-H-D-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Arsh Dalla, his, his nickname is Arsh Dalla. Yeah. Okay, yes. So uh, he was apparently involved in this shootout in a small Ontario town. And he's known as a Khalistani terrorist. I believe that uh, your country has a warrant out for him. Yeah. And that has not been reported in the Canadian media. Not one mainstream media has yet reported his arrest. Now, I've reported, many independents have reported it. Uh, it's been reported in Britain and, of course, in India and, and really all around the world. But the Canadian news media have not reported this. And I, I find that, I find that uh, not a surprise but still very disgusting, but it just shows you how difficult it is to have the truth come out. Oh, absolutely. I'm actually even more surprised by the fact that he was actually arrested, if that's what you say, that he has been arrested. You know, the Canadian police arresting him. I'm sure he's already out uh, on bail, given that he has uh, given that, as you mentioned, about the ecosystem. And I come back to how, how much do you think these Khalistanis have been able to infiltrate into the security system or the police setup in Canada? Well, first of all, I first, first uh, joined the police service in 1975. Oh, okay. A long, long time ago. Yeah. But you know, even back then, there's always groups, organized crime, political groups, Absolutely. people who try and infiltrate government and the police. And it's happening today. We just had uh, a few months ago, uh, a, one of the police employees, a woman, was arrested. She was in charge of criminal records for one of the big police services. Yeah. And she was associated to a criminal motorcycle gang. So, uh -huh. uh, and she's in charge of records, if you can believe yeah. that. I mean, uh, yeah. so, so this has always happened. But I had some Canadians write to me, uh, many write to me since I started covering this, and a number of them. Uh, maybe 10 or 12, talked about how in their riding, and this is all across Canada, riding is a little political section in Canada, and when there's an election, provincial, municipal, local, or federal, they go and they go to vote, and every single candidate of the main parties is a Sikh. So they will vote, and there's a, if you vote liberal, it's a Sikh. If you vote conservative, it's a Sikh. If you vote NDP, it's a Sikh. That takes a lot of money. And it also happens in communities where uh, the Sikhs have enclave. Now, don't get me wrong here. Uh, this, <clears throat> in, when you get lots of immigration, people settle together because they want to be comfortable with their friends and relatives. Yeah. Italians did it. Chinese did it. The Japanese did it. That, that, that's fine. And in many areas, there will be all Italians on, on the ballot. I mean, this is just what happens. There's nothing sinister about that. But what is sinister is when this group seems to have a very focused political agenda. They are associated with terrorism, terrorists, and terrorist attacks. And they have gained a foothold of power 
and authority in our structures here in Canada way out of proportion to their numbers. Well, that is true. You know, one thing um, that I, I, I should mention here is that I would like to distinguish between the six and the Khalistanis, you know, not all Sikhs are Khalistanis. And in India, we have such a large Sikh population and uh, they are uh, as patriotic as me or anyone else for that matter. You know, but this Khalistanis, uh, uh, you know, who are fighting for the separate uh, homeland, which is interestingly is carved out of India, uh, not of Pakistan, not from Canada or from New Zealand, but from, from India, they are uh, the problem. But, you know, since you talked about this radicalization, you talked about the fact that how uh, at the local municipal elections, you have sick candidates and you seem to say such as that there's an orchestrated move, right, uh, to pop up because it takes money to, you know, put up candidates. So in your sense, how, do, how does Canada unravel this now? You know, uh, should Canada have a strong uh, policy against criminal activities if you're caught for criminal activities, you are uh, you are detained, arrested, detained, and sent back to the country of origin, right? Deported. I wish I had a simple answer for you, but it's complex. Everything is is complex, and there are layers. There's all sorts of good people, I'm sure, and I do mean this, who believe they would want to seek homeland. That's their thing. They've come over here. I think that maybe there are people who wouldn't do acts of violence to get that homeland. Yeah. But there's many who do, who, who do. Yeah. And, and I say uh, it takes three generations to really make a Canadian. Many people are, are, are insulted by that. And then I say to them, well, suppose I came to India and I learned one of your official languages and I don't know how long it takes to get an Indian citizenship, but three or five years or whatever it takes. And I, I did that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But your family has been in India for a hundred generations. I would be an Indian citizen, but I would still have a love of back home of my, my Canada. But Absolutely. then my, then my children and then my children's children. And then you have, that these ties, you never forget where you came from, but your focus becomes here in Canada, or if I'm living in India, my focus becomes in India. I, I, I really think that's true. It's a truth. So, but here we seem to have some second generation Calistanis who have continued the political agitation and frankly, the violence, um, They've, they've continued because, don't forget, Air India bombing was so long ago. That was in 1985, I think, 84? Exactly, 85, 85. Right. That's a long time ago. And yet still, here in Canada, we have a second generation who are adopting the propensity for violence. And also, there's a large organized crime, uh, a large organized crime sector in the Calistanis. Now, I want to be careful here, and I want to be very clear. Every new group of immigrants that has ever come to Canada, there's always been that core criminal uh, that comes over to the Italian mafia, the Chinese mafia, the Vietnamese gang. I've fought them all when I was a police officer. So, so there's always that core, the Jewish mafia. There's always a core in a community that are, 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 are criminals. But when, yeah. that, when that combines with a political agenda, well, you've got trouble because they use crime to fund their political agenda, the groups that, that, that do this. Now, we had Canada's largest drug lab bust in Vancouver just a few weeks ago. They were all Punjabis. Not all of them were Canadians. Yeah. That's, a, that's a fact. I completely agree with you that uh, in the past, you know, immigrants have led to, for example, let's say the Italian mafias, right? But I'm not really sure whether, you know, Indians have gone out to many countries and nowhere in any, in, in, anywhere in the world have Indians been looked as criminal groups, right? 
or being mafia. I've never heard of an Indian mafia outside of India, right? We, of course, have, like any other country, we'll have gangs and uh, violence and things like that. But Indians have largely been seen as people who've contributed to the economy there, people who've grown up as, as doctors, as lawyers, as nurses, as so many other white collar jobs that Indians have uh, uh, set out to be. And they are now running some of the biggest companies in the world are run by Indians. So it's surprising that, and I, I, I get you point, I'm not blaming you because the kind of street violence, the kind of gun running, the kind of narcotic business that you find these groups into, you would tend to believe that. But I think it's more to do with the Khalistanis rather than, and I'm saying not the six, the Khalistanis, because there are also six who are contributing great to the Canadian society and the Hindus, of course, there and Christians also. There are a lot of my Christian friends are in Canada. So I'm just so I just wanted to understand. Do you think that is this the are they using this whole political Khalistan thing to run their as a friend for their business, which is illegal trafficking, uh, gun smuggling, narcotics? You're a cop. That's why I'm asking you this. Well, the short <clears throat> the short answer is yes, but. You always find this happening when there's a political agenda and then you get acts of violence and then you get the organized crime and it, it's justified. We're doing this, we're, we're getting this money, we're doing this extortion or whatever they're doing to help the political cause. The Irish Republican Army, yeah. they always used to do that. The Vietnamese gangs, they always used to do that. And... They always pick on their own. Usually new new Canadians in Canada don't speak the language, fear the police, because maybe the police were bad back home, whatever country they came from. So they are very vulnerable. We found this uh, in the 1980s in the Chinese and Vietnamese community. The gangs wouldn't bother uh, whites or, or anyone else. They would only extort and commit crimes against their own. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay, uh, because their own fear them, and their their own will not report to the police. So once again, it, it's a complex situation, but it's been seen before. And yes, I believe that the Khalistani separatists are using profits of crime to further their political and their personal wealth too. So, um, you know, it always starts out for the cause, but that new car really helps the cause, I'm sure. And that Absolutely. beautiful home. Yes. Yes. And I've seen those Khalistani car rallies, amazing cars that they have. But uh, on that note, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining at, uh, us at the print and for speaking to our viewers. I sincerely hope that Canada is able to get out of this, right? Uh, and Canada goes back to the Canada that I've that I have known, or my relatives in Canada have known, which is a much more peaceful uh, country, you know, which offers growth opportunities to each and every one, irrespective of where they uh, belong to. But it seems now that the Trudeau government, after having played, uh, you know, uh, footsies with with the Khalistanis, is now understanding the problem and seems to be taking some kind of hard measures on immigration, on the number of people who are coming in or the kind of people who are coming in. I hope uh, the government, the elections are coming up. I, I hope whichever government comes to power, even if it's the Trudeau government, realizes the mistake and brings back Canada to where it was earlier. Thank you so much for joining here at The Print. My pleasure. See you next time. See you.